Welcome back to the next episode in our series on software testing. Today, we are going to be talking about integration testing. Let me explain. Here it goes. A's for ambition. Be what I want to be. See past the situation that's in front of me. Doubt is an enemy. We say but there is one other type of testing that I wanted to discuss. Now, it is related to the previous two, but I think it deserves its own distinct chat, and that's integration testing. Now, what I mean by that is testing one piece or module of your software that may have been built by a distinct team um, with another piece. So that might be the CRM with the accounting software or various parts of modules of your software. So it's interesting you talk about integration tests because integration tests are broadly really misunderstood. They mean a hundred different things to a hundred different people. So if a unit test is a, a test that tests a single function, an integration test traditionally was any test that tested more than one function at the same time. So flashing back to when I was earlier talking about TDD, actually, ironically, a lot of TDD tests by default became integration tests because they, the, the difference between the, the two methodologies is what they deem as the unit of isolation, whereas the unit of isolation in a TDD test is the TDD test, and the unit of isolation in the unit test is the function that it's testing. So as the mid 2000s rolled on, people conflated that with testing out of bound systems, databases, specifically databases, and then web services when integrating with a lot of APIs became common. And integration tests kind of moved up a level and slowly started encompassing all these other third party systems. It's kind of interesting because the classic testing philosophy should always be don't test things you can't control. So very simply, don't test your operating system. You can't patch that. Test that your software works on it, but don't test features of your operating system. Don't test the features of your database. You have to presume they work. So actually, all of these systems tended to get swept up into broad end-to-end -end tests. An end-to-end -end test is another variously ambiguous phrase, but it generally means in the real world, someone is driving the user interface of your application and by driving the user interface, be it a desktop app or a web app, by coincidence, they are exercising the touch points with your database and with your third party providers and all these other things. So people kind of got into the habit of these broad integration tests, which then kind of started to be known as end to end tests. And then often, well, then from about 2010, 2011 onwards, people started rebranding them as either functional tests or BDD tests. But the philosophy was kind of the same thing. You take a piece of software and you come in through the top. I think the term that I was using when I said that was what we understood in our team, and maybe mm -hmm. a version of what you might call an integration test was, um, you would have a single module, whatever that may be within your system, and everything yeah. else would be like simulated or mocked out, connect these modules and you'd make sure they work together. Conflation with end-to-end -end tests and integration tests is a fascinating topic all, all of itself because they're kind of the same thing, but they're also drastically different because people that started moving their way up the pyramid here, they ended up in this wonderfully interesting anti-pattern of lots and lots of slow, brittle tests. Not normally because of their database, though, you know, people would put databases in and the idea with, with tests is that they're all deterministic. So they would end up having to tear up databases and tear them down. And at the time, maybe technology wasn't so sophisticated. In, and this was really before the proliferation of containerization and Docker and stuff like that, where actually scripting up databases and tearing them down was a little bit brittle and would fail. And once those things kind of started solidifying people, then a layer up started realizing that actually testing into third party stuff wasn't that great as part of their development workflow because it was out of the realm of their control again. So they started isolating them. They would mock out external web services. They would put stubs in place and a whole bunch of products and ecosystems grew up to help people stub out third party dependencies. And that was great. Actually really, really nice sweet spot for testing. And once people grew through that, we've started to see a move towards Again, now we're, we're mid 20 teens and the proliferation of microservice architectures ironically dragged us back closer towards your original definition of integration tests. Because if you think about the way that software architecture changed at the same rate as testing styles change, which is like a, an interesting parallel line to track. As, as software was more monolithic, coarser grain tests felt easier to write because it was harder to exercise small components in a system. 
as then software started to disperse and cloud computing and functions as a service and all this other cool stuff started picking up actual popularity and people were replatforming their architectures on these technologies. It was then easier again to test small granular components of the system and the interaction between two or more of them in isolation from one another because many people's architectures started in inheriting these characteristics of kind of here's a baseline of mix and match systems that we then remix together by some kind of orchestrating API to build a product for our consumers. And actually the testing styles mutated with the architecture, which is wonderful. So there's obviously a, obviously been a change in the types of integration testing and what you would consider to be integration testing. But from a high level, you're running a development team, you're looking to build reliable software that's going to work with all the various integrations it has. Brilliant sweet point for this. And I almost really trollily want to say it doesn't matter. What matters is exactly two things. When something breaks in your system, two tests should fail. There should be some kind of automated functional test somewhere that says login broke or uploading user profiles broke. And there then there should be a second lower level unit test somewhere that is the reason that thing broke. That's kind of the nice balanced sweet spot. And, and what I found as I pushed through, and I, I've spent a lot of time training people how to write good tests. And a good test is a test that you don't have to rewrite when your implementation changes. You know, the idea is that good tests survive refactoring, changing the form of something without changing what it does. So you have these test cases that are always green. And then two of them fail at once. And one of them you can say, hey, programmer man, there's a red light down there. What's that? And you'd be like, oh, well, the, the version of a library updated here and something is wrong. Cool. And then the covering test at the very top should say, yes, and it broke image upload. And whatever balance you have there, and, and my sweet spot personally has always been start out with TDD tests to flesh out your behavior. As soon as those tests feel like they're getting complicated from a development point of view, or they're taking time, or they seem to be taking longer to write than the value they add because of complexity, you break down into lower level unit tests to test small algorithmic pieces of your code. And then what you actually find out is you end up in this natural ebb and flow of writing a very, very high level test over a piece of functionality. And then when that piece of functionality gets complicated, you have a suite of unit tests at the bottom that support it. And you end up writing a big thing and then getting stuck and then writing several unit tests. And as soon as your unit tests pass, actually you're covering TDD tests end up passing. And then you write your next TDD test until it gets complicated, then a few unit tests to support it. And what you end up with is kind of this glut at the bottom of algorithmically driven unit tests over pieces of complexity in your software. And interesting, that's where all your special sources, that's where all the the, the actual magic in your software that isn't just a web app is. And then the higher level tests, and some, some people use languages like Gherkin, which is a natural language, plain English way of defining tests. Some people write code for them. Some people use tools like Selenium to script clicky clicky tests. It doesn't really matter how this they're written. way of defining your tests in English so that everybody understands it. Exactly that. Mm -hmm breaking it down into some kind of scripted or automatic. Exactly that. So, so a, a glut of low level unit tests to support the hard work and a complete comprehensive coverage at the top of all of your features. Because very, very simply, if you don't want it to break, you've got to have a test for it. Or I promise you, absolutely promise you at some point it will break and you won't be the person that discovers it breaks. It'll be someone that's trying to buy something from you that works it out. 